So hello everyone um, and welcome to our presentation on breaking the beam, a new type of attack at, that aims at exploiting VSAT satellite communication from the earth. But first let me introduce ourselves. I'm Vincent, uh, I'm a cybersecurity researcher for more than uh, 20 years. I've been uh, focusing mostly on the security of wireless uh, networks in my research and currently I'm acting as a director of the Cyber Defense Campus in Switzerland. We have also with us today Johannes, he's a PhD student from the Ruhr University uh, of Bochum in Germany and he's researching uh, the software security of space and satellite systems. And also with us today is uh, Robin, he's uh, a graduate student from ETH Zurich and uh, he has been also working at the Cyber Defense Campus uh, in the context of his master thesis. So let me start with what VSAT uh, communication is. VSAT stands for Very Small Aperture Terminal. This is a special type of um, satellite communication um, that uh, communicates uh, over uh, geostationary satellites. You, you can see here um, on the picture on the left a maritime VSAT communication system. Um, <laughs> A maritime VSAT, can you please switch off the, the, the music? Thanks. Yeah. We have a maritime VSAT communication system that is equipped on the ship, or on the right, we have a terrestrial uh, VSAT uh, system that is typically uh, used for uh, terrestrial uh, applications. These VSAT communication systems, they typically provide data, uh, vi video, or voice communication services. Um, and uh, they are not so small as the name stands. Uh, these antenna dishes can be typically the size of a one meter or two meters. Um, okay, the, um, if we look at uh, a system, a VSAT communication system, it basically consists of uh, three components. We have a central hub. The central hub is typically connected to the internet and uh, we have a satellite, geostationary, geostationary satellite, that's a satellite that is in the orbit such that it um, rotates at the same uh, speed uh, around the Earth at the, uh, as the Earth is rotating uh, around its own axis. So the satellite stays always at the same uh, location uh, compared to the Earth. And then we have a VSAT endpoint, that's a dish with a modem where users can connect their mobile device or smartphone, laptops, whatever. If we look at the communication, it's a bi-directional bi communication. So we have a, a forward channel uh, from the central hub that goes over the satellite to the VSAT endpoint. Um, and we have a return channel that goes from the VSAT endpoint back over the satellite uh, to the central hub. The satellite is really uh, very dumb. It's typically a bent pipe, so it just takes the signals from the uplink that it receives and forwards them uh, to the downlink. That's the only thing that the satellite is typically uh, doing is in terms of uh, signal uh, forwarding. Now, if we look at the security of uh, VSAT communication systems, uh, we can consider uh, three thread models. And the first uh, thread model is basically an attacker that uh, tries to attack the system from the internet. Um, so it will attack and try to uh, infiltrate from the central hub. And basically this is also what happened and what everybody was talking for the last two years. This is what happened in February uh, 2022. Um, uh, in where at the same time, on the same day as the Russian invaded uh, the Ukraine, there was a, an attack uh, basically uh, through uh, this uh, ground, system sh uh, ground system network to deploy uh, bogus malicious uh, firmwares to uh, thousands of uh, VSAT endpoints. And this, this attack uh, ba basically uh, was, was, uh, was uh, basically uh, rendering thousands of uh, modems uh, unavailable and, and had to re be replaced or updated. Now, um, this attack has been presented last year and the year before at DEF CON, so many people have uh, analyzed what happened there. So there is a, a second threat model, which basically uh, looks uh, at uh, attacks uh, against the satellite itself. Um, so it, uh, basically the idea would be to attack the satellite directly over their air interface. 
So we have been do doing some research the previous years on these types of attacks. For example, at IEEE S&P in 2020, we showed how it is possible to intercept uh, a VSAT uh, communication um, passively with an eavesdropper. We have been also doing some, some research presenting this year at Aerospace uh, uh, Conference about uh, reconnaissance, how to basically uh, discover capabilities of satellites. Or last year, I, I, I at IEEE SNP, Johannes was also presenting a, a paper that shows uh, how you could uh, find the vulnerabilities in satellites and try to exploit those. And then the, the focus of uh, today is to look at uh, the threat model of an attacker, the third threat model, which basically uh, attacks directly the VSAT endpoint. And this is the new thing that we are considering in this work. Basically, we, we, uh, we, uh, we try to understand how, how feasible it is to directly uh, attack uh, the endpoint without going through a central app or the satellite. So our research contribution in this work, uh, we have been uh, reverse engineering um, a VSAT modem. It's from uh, iDirect. It's the uh, new tech MDM2200. That's the model we have been analyzing. And uh, we have been reverse engineering the entire software stack as well as the communication protocol stack up to, uh, down to the physical layer. So um, we found several vulnerabilities in the software and the communication stack of the modem, which allows us to implement uh, three over-the-air wireless attacks uh, that use software-defined radios. And these uh, attacks allow us to um, remotely reset the modem, to update a malicious firmware to the modem, and also to obtain a remote admin shell. And Finally, we demonstrate the feasibility uh, of these uh, attacks, to launch these attacks by breaking the beam. And what do we mean by breaking the beam? Basically, uh, the idea is that we inject signals uh, from, not directly uh, from, from the satellite, but from, from uh, a side beam, from a, an attacker that is on Earth, that is close to the satellite. Typically, what people have, the conventional wisdom, what people have assumed is that Satellites communicate, we said satellite communication is quite robust against uh, signal injection attacks from the side because you have typically a high directional beam towards the... Okay. Sorry for that. Okay, am I connected? Yeah. Okay, so the idea... Yeah. The, the idea, the, what people assume, this is basically since the, the, the dish has a very high di directionality, uh, basically it will be difficult to inject uh, signals uh, from the side. And uh, what we show basically in, in our research is actually it's possible from, the, from a side beam to inject these signals, these attacks uh, from, from the earth. So with that, uh, I want to give the word to Johannes, who will present uh, his uh, research or his uh, work on reverse engineering the, the modem we've been looking at. All right, thank you. So, um, so far we've basically heard what kind of setup we need to actually attack these modems. And as already introduced, we are attacking the new tech modem MDM2200. And we also looked at a different modem called from Viasat, exactly the one attacked in Ukraine, not in this talk, but in the research paper this is all based on. Um, but we picked this, this iDirect modem, or also new uh, iDirect, and uh, it's, it's kind of interchangeably since iDirect acquired new tech some while ago. Um, so iDirect owns all of these products at this point. And uh, there's a pretty good case study since they themselves today are own, uh, according to their website, rank themselves first in maritime communications, in uh, aerospace communications, or rather in the basically commercial planes, uh, having visa systems, and also in media and, and network broadcasting. Um, so while it's, it's pretty clear that this specific system that we are looking at here is not deployed on all of these, this, I want to be very clear, these vulnerabilities these vulnerabilities are not quite, um, you can't go out and basically pawn every airplane with it. This definitely won't work. It's a different system from the same company. So, um, so far basically we have this VSAT endpoint and it's separated into the antenna, which you basically place outdoor. Um, that's why it's also called outdoor unit. Then we have this modem, this, this small uh, little box that you place somewhere inside and that's why it's called indoor unit. Um, and all of this is basically connecting your local area network where you have your PC, Wi-Fi, etc. Um, so 
the, the really interesting part is really this modem in the middle, because this one is basically receiving the traffic from the satellite antenna, and it's doing signal processing on it, it's, all kinds of doing, it's doing all kinds of um, control plane management, etc. Um, and there are basically two kinds of traffic flowing through there. Usually these attacks and these talks at these conferences focus on internet traffic going from the antenna to this local area network. But we are only and exclusively focusing on the control plane traffic. Um, so this is often time separated either with a VPN or so. It's in this, in this specific case it's the same physical channel. Um, but we are only considering the control plane basically operating these modems. It has nothing to do with the actual LAN network. And to keep everything that I'm going to talk about um, like all nice and mapped up, I did a little chart. So basically on the left side we have the antenna um, and the right side our local area network and in the, big, in the middle a big uh, question mark that we are tr slowly trying to, to resolve. So first of all, order of business as usual because it's pretty fun to open anything up. I, I guess most here agree. Um, it, it's, you get a nice little circuit board, very unsurprising. And if you actually look up these uh, individual components, you see, for example, demodulator, which is, well, un unsurprisingly doing demodulation. You see some digital analog converter. You see an FPGA, which is doing a lot of signal processing, since this is way too much to be handled by these lower end ARM processors. And then finally, the microcontroller that we are going to focus on is some ARM V5 TE microcontroller. Um, so, not much progress yet. We basically just knew that there is some uh, RF decoding, signal processing um, stuff going on that, that I'm personally not going to focus on since I'm doing more on the software side. Um, so, what do we need for this? We actually need to dump the software off of this uh, modem. Um, and there are a plenty number of ways to do this. You could use like a bus pirate, sold off the flash chips. Um, it all seems pretty involved and I'm terrible with uh, any kind of hardware, so I definitely keep my hands off of that. Um, so instead, these modems oftentimes have a questionable web UI when it comes to security. Um, so when we basically looked for, blindly basically looked for some code injection, we found something. Obviously the code we only had afterwards. Um, but basically this entire website is uh, written as like bash scripts and uh, the server is basically just a ba bunch of bash scripts. And uh, if you basically insert the right string at the right time, then you just get a proper command injection and can just open a remote shell. It's, it's, it's really that simple. Um, and if you do this, then you have a nice mode, and then you have a nice console access to the actual modem, which is even more useful than using a bus pirate, since now we can actually run commands on the modem. All right, let, let's actually do this. Let's figure out how all of this is working. So in this specific case, um, we, when we see the network interface, we see some pretty regular stuff, ETH0, pretty clear what that is. We see some TUN network device, which are usually for VPNs, and one device that is not very common called modem. So where is this coming from? Um, so usually some of the, these network devices come from a specific kernel, and in this case there are in fact a few kernel objects that are shipped with this operating system. So we have something for DVB, um, which is basically the protocol or the underlying protocol of all of the satellite communication, so that's a pretty good hint. Something with new tech hardware abstraction layer, also pretty good hint. So we searched a little bit around in these kernel objects, and uh, yeah, we found exactly the code we were looking for. It's allocating some net device called modem, um, perfect. We can also look in Jira into what kind of functions it's exposing, definitely some sending function, not quite a receive function, um, but it's definitely working in some way. But interestingly, when we kind of grab through the list of functions and search for common terms on um, cryptography, like encrypting, decrypting, key, exchange, etc., we didn't find anything, um, which, is, which doesn't mean that there is no encryption, but it's, it's at least some kind of a hint. Um, so to update our system map, we have these drivers exposing this modem, which doesn't seem to have any crypto. Um, also, when we went through the code pass a little bit, we couldn't find anything. So we, at this point, we're just assuming that there's no, basically, data link layer protection here. Um, and then the next question is basically what kind of applications are listening there. So this modem interface is basically exposing network traffic, um, easy to consume on a Linux device, and you can just do accept, listen, receive, blah, blah, the usual kind of setup. And then there is, for example, an application called TCNet Clients, which is some third-party software called from Teletech. Um, so they basically um, ensure that the internet traffic is actually running. But for the control plane that I'm talking about, we are caring really only about this modem controller and SW download. So two software packets or two, two software applications running on the modem. And the first one we are going to focus on is modem controller, and it kind of does exactly what the name says. It controls um, configuration on the modem. Um, and when you basically look into the um, initialization routine, um, we've kind of found what we are looking for. There is at least some crypto, so that, that seems pretty good 
at a first glance. So we have some modem crypt in it. We can see that it's reading some modem database. And we can also see that it's uh, using some private key, pushing it somewhere. OK, so there seems to be something going on with crypto. But it, I, I won't bore you with code all, all the time. Um, so basically, it, it's receiving a terminal private key. The terminal private key is exchanged when you first turn on this modem after you receive it from your satellite service provider. So it's exchanging this thing and then storing it kind of permanently on your device. And then whenever you boot it up, um, it's loading this key and it's using this key as a key encryption key. What does a key encryption key do? It encrypts keys. Um, and basically, when you start up the modem, you receive two messages, one session key message and one network configuration message. Both of them control a the key that is actually used to encrypt this specific traffic, and the terminal private key is encoding both of these. And it works in a way that basically we have the hub, and the hub is sending a packet to the actual modem controller um, in some hub terminal envelope, which is some Google protobuf protocol. Um, and when we're looking at the code, first line basically passes this protobuf into some predefined data structure, um, and then it's doing some interesting stuff. So first, it's basically looking for some encryption flag. If it's not set, it's basically discarding the packet. If it's set, it's going on. Um, it's checking, is the counter of the packet defined in this network packet zero? Then it's pretty interesting. We define or we just assign the buffer to the message string. If it's not zero, then we actually decrypt it. So at least from this function, if we set it to zero, we can just skip the decryption, which is useful since we don't know the key. Um, but there, there's definitely something more to it, since if you just have counter zero, it might just be some key exchange protocol in the very beginning. Um, so there might be some receive counter matching going on, and that is exactly what we found. So basically, there's encryption manager, and it has a receive counter match functionality, and it takes the encryption manager and a packet counter and compares, is it the actual expected uh, counter? So if the previous one is 68, uh, it expects the next one to be 69. That, that sounds pretty nice. That sounds exactly like what we are looking for. And if we have to, if the match is false, it's doing a second check, which checks if the counter is unequal to zero. And only then it's discarding the message. But the interesting part is, if the counter is zero, then it's not discarding the message. So basically, this kind of, exactly the thing that it's trying to prevent, it's not preventing. Um, I guess there's some coding error. They probably meant to use some other counter, probably the reference counter from the modem and not the one from the packet. Um, but yeah, this basically allows us to kind of bypass the entire encryption of this um, modem controller, which is maybe not quite as it was intended. Or maybe it was. All right. Second part is this SW download application. Software updates are always fun from a security perspective, so let's take a look at that. So we have the hub, and the hub is basically sending out update signal packets uh, around once a second or 10 times a second, depending on the configuration. And these update signal packets basically tell you, hey, there's currently this software version available for this hardware revision on this port. So if you want to get it, just listen to me. And then SW Download decides, this sounds interesting. I want to receive these packets. And it's just subscribing to the correct multicast on the correct port and gets the current software version. Interestingly, there's no crypto on that. That's just UDP packets. And anybody can just go to any modem and essentially just broadcast their own software update. Um, but in, just in case you're too lazy to kind of build your own uh, Linux operating system and interface with the FPGA and everything, it gets easier and worse from a security perspective. So this also has a vulnerability if uh, missing encryption authentication is not enough. Um, basically, this is one of these update signaling packets. It's basically saying, OK, some U image ID, then it says octet for whatever reason. Um, and then it says, OK, there's a bulk size, there's a version that is associated with a specific update, there's a minimal version that you need, et cetera. And this octet part is pretty interesting, since this is the function that is parsing this. I'm not, I'm not making this up. Um, so basically, it has a static buffer of 80 bytes. And then it's using scanf with an unlimited uh, length string to pass this octet, just this octet part. Um, well, pr pretty, pretty easy from that part to, to gain some kind of control over the PC. But it shouldn't be that simple, right? There are still ASLR, stack canary, so something like that. Turns out they're using an ancient Linux version, um, version 2.6.35 of the kernel. And now some of you might be thinking, but hey, why is this guy talking about some ancient technology that nobody or that, that, that they found on some scrapyard? No, this was freshly installed for us in 2022. So this is not something super old. This is something they newly shipped to customers. Um, and also there are obviously no stack canaries, because if you have Linux 2.6.35, you probably don't bother about this part anyway. So to conclude, first, 
there's no data link protection in the in the in this modem kernel device. There is an encryption bypass on a modem controller, which is the only part in the control plane actually implementing crypto. Um, we can just broadcast updates as we want to this modem, and if this is not enough, we can also have a fully unmitigated remote code execution. Um, and we kind of tested all of this on a little bit wacky way. Basically, we are using the Ethernet port and reconfigured the firewall to send the packets to the to this modem network device um, for for easier testing. But obviously, the way more interesting approach is to actually do it wirelessly. And uh, what does a PhD student do when he doesn't want to figure out all of the uh, wireless parts? Find a perfect student to actually figure it out, and this is uh, Robin's turn now. Yeah, so let's address this remaining question mark. And for this, we started again by opening up this box, looking at what components are built in, and researching via their tech sheets and all resources we found how the hardware works. And from this, we could already deduct that there are two separate signal processing pipelines, one for the transmission and one for reception. In addition, we had a handy tool in the web interface, a diagnostic screen, which provided us with the internal states of the modem, including some states from the FPGA. And this confirmed our protocol assumptions, and it proved to be very helpful when implementing our attacker since we could see what packets have been parsed correctly and what isn't working yet. And finally, we had the binaries thanks to Joanna's work, which also proved very helpful since some of the parsing logic was implemented in the kernel modules, so not on dedicated ICs. And by studying that, we could know what the modem expected us to transmit. With these uh, three information sources, it became pretty clear that the protocol used here is DVB-RCS. The DVB uh, protocol suite comes from the TV broadcasting domain, but what's more important here is the RCS, which stands for Return Channel Over Satellite, because we don't want to have these one-way transmissions, but we need a return channel for the interactive uh, internet protocol behavior. What's best about this protocol is also that it's open and that's why there are lots of resources and specifications which are freely available. Also, it's kind of a meta protocol because it leverages multiple sub-protocols and defines how these sub-protocols interact with each other. In this regard, it's also important to mention S3P or Z3Play because NewTek never talks about DVB-RCS, but S3Play, which is their proprietary implementation of DVB-RCS. And since it's their own implementation and proprietary, there are some uniquenesses to it. So in some instances, we found that they deviated a little bit from the specification or they used some custom features to transmit some other compulsory data which is required. Um, now let's quickly go, go through these layers. At the lowest layer we have DVBS2, which is the protocol which handles all the wireless stuff. So if you're a bit familiar with these wireless protocols, it has all these basic features such as prepending a preamble, to synchronize, transmitter and receiver. It defines what modulation schemes are supported and it also defines the error correction codes. One layer higher up, we have MPEG transport streams and their task is to bundle multiple data streams into one bigger stream. And in this project, we've only implemented the forward channel, so I'm, I'm focusing on this forward channel from central hub to, to endpoints. And since we have this star topology where one central hub transmits to multiple endpoints, it's implemented as a broadcast channel that contains all these individual data streams. And that's why these MPEG transport streams are so useful. They are constructed in a hierarchical way at the lowest layer or, or lowest level there are elementary streams, which could be audio streams or video streams, or in our uh, context, data streams. These elementary streams are then bundled together 
to programs and a transport stream can finally be made up of multiples uh, of these programs. There's also some space for metadata or, or some configuration data, which is used to transmit the structure of these streams, but also to initialize the modem. Because when the modem starts up, it starts in, a, in an empty state and awaits instruction from the central hub. It has some pre-configured values, such as a frequency and a symbol rate, for where to expect these initial values. And this is called the initial carrier. And with this information transmitted on this carrier, it learns where to tune next to learn the configuration values for the final carrier where the data streams are finally transmitted. In our attacker implementation, we simplified things quite a bit. So we didn't transmit on three separate frequencies, but we used this flexibility of these transport streams to include all this information from the beginning and instruct the modem to retune over and over again, but each time demultiplex a different stream from within this uh, same transport stream. And this is like basically the high level overview of this protocol. There's only one thing left, which is uh, called multi-protocol encapsulation, which is a thin wrapper around the IP packets such that they can be included in these MPEG transport streams. But from there on up, it's really basic internet protocols, IP, uh, UDP and TCP. So with this knowledge and the understanding of these protocols, we attempted our attacker implementation. We chose a software-defined radio-based stack. We um, opted for a USRP uh, SDR, but really any other SDR could be chosen as well. And since SDRs are somewhat restricted in their output frequencies, we also bought some off-the-shelf components for upconverting these frequencies into the satellite frequency bands. Uh, for this modem, that's the KU and KA bands at roughly 10 to 10.7 uh, gigahertz, or uh, I believe even up to 15 gigahertz. And this totaled in a cost of about $2,000, but I'm pretty sure that it could be significantly reduced if you used a more do-it-yourself approach and didn't buy off-the-shelf components. For the software implementation, we chose GNU Radio, a popular framework for SDR applications. And as already mentioned, we only implemented the forward channel since this proved to be sufficient for our attacks. And GNU Radio was also chosen since we could leverage some of the um, built-in components for DVBS2 but everything on top of it, we implemented ourselves in a custom module. And through this approach, we started at a state where the modem wasn't connected, but we iteratively improved our attacker to be able to finally transmit some initialization such that the modem picked up the signal. And finally, we were able to transmit um, some messages here you see a TCB dump on the modem itself and it successfully receives some Hello World packages we are transmitting. So if we briefly look again at this map, we are now capable of injecting arbitrary IP packets into the modem's protocol, uh, into the modem's network stack. Now let's look at some attacks. The first most basic one we are talking about is a jamming attack, but it is interesting in, in this case because it acts as a building block for more advanced attacks. Because when we jam a modem, it no longer re receives the required synchroni synchronization packets and configuration packets. And as a result, it resets itself to the initial state and awaits new connection instructions. And this can be used by an att attacker to break the connection of a running modem and then provide new initialization instructions to steer it away from the legitimate central hub to a malicious one. And once initialized, we can mount a malicious firmware update 
attack, as uh, Johannes has explained before. This works by first transmitting a signalization packet to one of these internal binaries, uh, SW download, to signal that an update is available, what version is available, and on what port, uh, on what UDP port to receive it. And if this version is higher than the currently installed version, the modem will start listening on that port and receive these messages. And once again, to, uh, I want to emphasize that these messages are neither authenticated nor encrypted. So it's easy to exploit this. And that's what we did. We transmitted a malicious update. And as you can see in the logs, it correctly receives these packets it, and it tries to install them. But we set in this case an invalid checksum to prevent the modem from breaking since uh, we, we, ha we needed to use it afterwards as well. But this proves that a malicious firmware ca can be installed to basically do arbitrary damage also to just execute the denial of service attack. The second attack I want to talk about is a remote code execution attack where we leverage the buffer overflow vulnerability Joannes ex has explained. And we implemented this one with two payloads, one where we simply turn on an LED on the modem to have a visual indication, and the second one where we opened a reverse shell towards a host in the LAN. But, thank you. <laughs> um, but if the modem would be connected via return channel to the central hub, such a reverse shell could also be opened to any connected host. We, we chose a host in the LAN because we haven't initialized the return channel. Now next, I wanna quickly show a demo of this attack. It's this remote code execution, and we uh, implemented here the LED turn on uh, so that the transmission LED on the modem lights, lightens up. It wouldn't turn on in this case because as mentioned again, the return channel isn't initialized. So here you see our attacker, uh, the GNU radio implementation, which starts transmitting and the up converter setup. And on the other side of the room, there's the transmitter with the web interface open. And it should pick up the signal any moment, initialize itself. And once receiving the data, the transmission LED the second from the right lightens up. So this works. Finally, we wanted to explore the conditions under which such an attack can be successfully mounted. And for this, we transmitted from different angles both in the horizontal plane and in the vertical plane to find out if such an attack is successful not only from in front of the modem. Because the antenna is a directional antenna and must be directly targeted at the satellite, so it would be much more powerful if we can launch such an attack also from other angles. And we found that there is a range of angles from where such an attack can be successfully mounted, not only from directly in front of it, here shown in green. Also keep in mind that this data has been gathered in an anechoic chamber where reflections are minimized. So if this is performed in the real world, where there are roofs and walls, you have much more reflections and so the success ratio is only going up. We have also written a paper about this, where we go a bit more into the details, also about these conditions. Um, if you're interested in that, please check it out. It's available online, or we're also next week at Usenix in Philly. And then, then there's one last thing. So far, we have talked about targeting one specific modem. But during our research, we found out that the modem also supports broadcast transmissions. And this allows us to target any modem of this type without any prior information about its MAC address or any other identifier. And this, as a result, 
allows us to target any modem that is in reach. And if you imagine an attacker that is not only capable of injecting signals directly by transmitting it to the modem, but also in the uplink by first transmitting to the satellite, it would be capable of not targeting only one modem, but all modems within an entire satellite beam, which is an entire region. All right, so, so what is the real world impact of all of this? Basically, the setup that we bought um, is around $2,000 of where the up converter to converting from whatever 6 gigahertz SDR can do to KU band um, is the, the biggest part. So if you, have, if you happen to have one of those around, it's probably a lot cheaper for you and usually uh, you would also have an SDR. Um, so then it's probably pretty uh, easy to pull off. Um, so these attacks should generally work on all the modems that use SAT3 Play, not just MDM2200, but there are also plenty, a long list of other of these protocols, not just SAT3 Play. Um, ultimately, we assume that the market share of these modems is 10 to 20% out of a few million deployed. I know this is not a precise number, but it's pretty hard finding these kinds of numbers here. Um, one important part that uh, we skipped so far is the responsible disclosure process. Um, so obviously NewTek doesn't exist anymore and um, iDirect took over their product so we messaged to iDirect. Um, we first uh, sent the first emails to kind of all public email addresses two years ago and then a few weeks afterwards again. Um, in November 2023 we uh, sent out another wave of emails including to high ranking officials at the company that we found for example through LinkedIn etc. Um, and ultimately we disclosed and escalated vulnerabilities to the Swiss, Swiss National Cybersecurity Center and CSC. Um, after that and the iDirect direct ask for a reproducer script for these vulnerabilities um, and we are now in the process of allocating CVEs for these vulnerabilities. So what are kind of some kind of mitigations? Obviously that's a pretty broad question here since um, the, the main problem is that we are lacking security from the foundation in a lot of parts. Um, so obviously something like physical layer or data link layer security, uh, for example through Mac layer encryption um, as we have seen on other modems would be an option. Um, source authentication through for example the protocols actually validating that not some uh, random network DEF CON guy is actually just sending the software update um, or on the, on the network layer maybe IPsec or some other VPN solutions. Also, um, maybe not using uh, Linux kernel version 2.6.35 on something that is shipped uh, these days is maybe also an, uh, an option. Um, but yeah, it's it's a pretty big, uh, pretty broad topic, and obviously the, the the solution to the specific, for example, remote code execution should also be pretty clear. And with that, essentially, we showed uh, the reverse engineering of one of um, of one probably broadly used Vsat system. We identified numerous attack vectors and vulnerabilities. We also built a full end-to-end -end wireless attack where we really can just take an SDR and pawn a, a working modem. Um, we successfully performed signal injection attack that way, um, and we are as certain as we can be without actually testing it, which is obviously not quite feasible. Um, that this would work on a satellite, ultimately breaking the beam. And we do have some time left, so um, if you have any questions, feel free to come to one of the microphones in the front. Otherwise, um, talk to us uh, in, the, in a few minutes or so in the back. So I actually do have several questions. Uh, one of the big things with satellite modems is that they have legendary latency. I think that would be the kindest way to put it. Um, a lot of the problems with security um, applications in satellite environments is because you have very specific timeouts, right? But a lot of these things are going like 20,000 miles round trip in order to even finish a TCP connection. And so why IPsec, which is pretty vulnerable to those latencies, would that be a suggested in your opinion? That's an excellent question. Um... Maybe just don't use IPsec. I don't think that uh, that is maybe the quite best option. Um, other vendors use um, VPN solutions. Quite honestly, I don't know if they're based on IPsec, so maybe IPsec is not the best option. It's some some protocol like IPsec that implements ultimately some VPN as some some solution generally. I think it might be TLS that they might use. That's fair. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And if you have any more questions, uh, let us know off uh, off stage. <laughs> 